Um, it's been a really good day today, actually. I've really enjoyed it. And one thing I did learn was that when I went for a comfort break just now to wash my hands very thoroughly <laughs> and wait until somebody else was in there so they could see me doing it as, <laughs> as proof. So, um, what's happening with Brexit and animal welfare in terms of what the BVA is doing? Well, it's often said that you know, welfare standards in this country are amongst the highest in the world. And actually, there is some evidence for that. A rating from the World Animal Protection uh, Body said that there are four countries which have the top rating, the United Kingdom, and then if you look very carefully with your um, geographical knowledge, you've looked for a similar coloured countries on the uh, map, you'll see Austria and Switzerland and New Zealand all have a top rating from that agency. So these things are not the be all and end all, but I think it's highly significant. So there is some evidence for saying that we have some of the highest standards of animal welfare in the world. So we all know about the referendum on Brexit and we're due to leave the EU in March of next year. Our reaction as an organisation was to say we still wanted to interact globally and on a European stage, that we were outward-looking scientific and veterinary community. We didn't want to recede in to Little Britain. And one of our first actions was to set up a working group which took evidence from all sorts of veterinary and non-veterinary organisations to look at the implications of Brexit for our profession and for animal health and welfare. We came out with a Brexit report just over a year ago which had 52 asks of things that we felt were issues that needed to be addressed and considered by government. Some of them represented challenges. There were some that were actually opportunities. It wasn't all negative by any means, but a lot of it was challenges that we saw. And we have this nice little graphic, and there should be some postcards with this on perhaps this evening. No one's quite sure if they're in the building, but they should be there this evening for you. And this represents where we are with our Brexit work. You can see there's four corners, trade, animal and public health, agriculture and animal welfare. And these all link into the central pillar, which is so important, which is the veterinary workforce. Absolutely crucial that we have a resilient and sufficient workforce to deliver on all these things in a post-Brexit world. One of the things that's very key in the workforce is asking for vets to become added to the shortage occupation list so that it's easier for veterinary surgeons to come to this country and work. This might just be on a temporary basis, but to see us over this precipice of Brexit where we could leave and lose an awful lot of our European colleagues. If we look at trade, we know there's likely to be a huge increase in the amount of trade certification because we may well be a third country. Uh, with regard to Europe. Um, animal and public health, the government has committed to maintain animal health and welfare standards which are, are at least as high as they are now and could be better and we feel that's a very, very important uh, result. In agriculture, we've been looking very carefully at the agriculture picture post-EU, particularly with how um, there are changes to cap payments which of course will um, stop then. And animal welfare, of course, will be the main thrust of my short talk this afternoon. So in animal welfare, we have two specific things which I think are worth talking about. We lobbied very hard for animal sentience to be embedded in the UK law. And we also um, got a commitment from the Secretary of State that animal health and welfare will be considered as public goods going forward. So if we look at um, animal welfare legislation, we know that about 80% of the legislation covering animal welfare we have in the UK comes from the European Union, okay? And that should all be rolled over into UK law as we leave EU. And of course, that's a process that's ongoing at the moment. The other aspect of this, which is very important, we have our own very, very robust Animal Welfare Acts, which cover the four devolved areas or the four areas of the UK. And those will remain very, very strong pieces of legislation. If we look at sentience, sentience was set out in Article 13 of the Lisbon Treaty. And that basically says that when any government is making policy, law, legislation, rules, you name it, they have to take into account the fact that animals are sentient. So that's a very, very important safety net, which we feel needs to be there for the future. So the government cannot ignore the fact that animals are sentient and can suffer when legislation is being made. So at the moment, we have very, very strong legislation on welfare, which is great. 
This is a very important aspect that we feel should be in the legislation before we leave the EU, because it's currently there as part of the Lisbon Treaty. We need to make sure that is there for the longer term to protect animal welfare in this country. When the debate about animal sentience took place, there was huge uproar, uproar, outcry from people saying the government weren't interested because they didn't roll it over in the withdrawal bill. And I'd like to think the BVA took a much more calm um, and sensible and measured approach to this. We didn't join the sort of baying crowd for blood, saying that MPs don't care about welfare, because actually our experience is that most MPs really do care about welfare. What we did do was give a measured approach and explain why sentience was, was so important. We are involved in the media. And probably the most um, obvious thing we did is we got nearly 1,200 members, vets, vet nurses and students to write an, uh, an open letter calling on the government to call to put um, Article 13 to be enshrined in domestic law after Brexit. Not necessarily just because of our work, but as a very important part of it, DEFRA did produce draft legislation that's been uh, scrutinised by the EFRA committee. And although currently that is on hold, uh, we are assured that they are working very hard to get something in place so that the concept of sentience is included in British legislation post uh, departure from Europe. So that's very, very important. If we look at agriculture policy, which has received an awful lot of publicity recently, um, we dis um, dis determined six principles that would colour our approach to agricultural policy post EU. Number one, support for animal health and welfare as public goods. And public goods, as we've mentioned before, very, very important. The concept of public goods are, are things for which are often intangible, but have a real value, but you can't sell them. And so, therefore, there's a very strong case for government paying farmers and producers to cover the value of those public goods. Animal health and welfare absolutely fall into that category as far as we're concerned. And making sure that any money that is used from government to incentivise um, the agricultural sector, the benefits are really maximised and they're not spent inappropriately. We're a devolved nation and it's very, very important that the devolved administrations are closely involved with all of this. It's not just an England thing. Compliance with World Trade Organisation rules is very important. Any subsidies or payments which are made mustn't go against WTO rules, otherwise that might affect our ability to trade going forward. Really important that it harmonises with any cross-governmental strategic goals. And of course, key to all of this, as we say repeatedly, is veterinary surgeons are the key to this. These are the people who can police this, they can certify, and they're absolutely key to driving the whole um, welfare and health strategy after we leave Europe, as they are now. Important we have enough vets, as I've said before, and we are concerned about number of vets. As we leave EU, we may be seeing a flood of vets who decide either not to come to the UK from Europe or even leave the UK, and this is a real concern for us. So the government consulted on their post-European um, agricultural policy in the Health and Harmony Command paper. Health and Harmony is not a type of hairspray, for those of you old enough to remember those adverts. Um, but that is all about, their theme there is to replace cap payments, which are currently made, and replace them with direct farm payments. And the big question is, what determines the payment? Currently, it's done on area of land. Now, of course, I think the feeling is it must be much more um, specific. Farm subsidies, as we currently know them, or at least the sums of money which are used now, will probably continue until about 2022, although we don't know that for certain, and then almost certainly may reduce, as well as being far more targeted. The government is talking about public money for public goods, which absolutely tunes in with what we feel is important. And amongst those, animal health and welfare are paramount from our point of view. Other things that they've talked about is environment, communities, um, and social structure being very, very important. So my apologies for a rather busy slide here, but some of the potential schemes that have been talked about are perhaps payments for farmers delivering higher welfare outcomes. Now, that's a really interesting one because we've already heard from the presentation earlier on how difficult it is to understand and to measure welfare. So are any welfare um, 
high welfare systems or higher welfare systems must be based on real evidence, a combination of measurable and transparent outcomes as well as inputs. You can't just have, oh, well, cows that are outside, pigs are outside, a higher welfare. It's not as simple as that. Uh, new approaches or technology which can improve welfare outcomes is very, very important. And, of course, information to the consumer. And key to that is farm assurance schemes so that the consumer can know what their farm assurance scheme means and what it actually is telling them about the welfare and quality of farming and husbandry on that farm. Really important to actually get a grip on endemic disease. A lot has been done, but there's more to be done. And this could provide an opportunity for those producers who really want to get endemic disease under control and work through recognised systems to get more payment to recognise that. We talk about the animal health pathway, which is being talked about at the moment, which is a way of matching the disease status of animals together with its um, any movements. There's a new movement system in place, trying to really get on top of what the disease statement, the disease um, uh, disease statuses of any of any um, of any holding. That's very very important. And then, of course, increased use of data in all that many forms could be really important. <laughs> So in our response to that consultation document, I should add, we've been responding to consultation documents like they're going out of fashion. We get them at a rate of about one every two weeks from government, from devolved governments. Very, very important part of our work that's keeping us really busy. We have a fantastic team who deal with the nuts and bolts of that. But we strongly welcome public money for public goods. That will come as no surprise based on what I've said. And we came up with five things here which we felt were really important. Any welfare scheme had to have veterinary involvement, so there was a science base to it. Should be outcomes based rather than just what looks nice to the uninformed observer. There should perhaps be a stewardship programme which actually has some measures of animal welfare which are quite objective. We should be looking at new technologies and we should make more use of farm assurance. So, you'll be glad to know I'm going to stop there. We work very hard with government. We spend a lot of time lobbying individuals and working with um, DEFRA and other organisations. We've been extremely fortunate to have the support of Angela Smith, who started things off this morning, and Neil Parrish, who is um, sponsoring our reception tonight. So, we're extremely grateful to them for that. I'll just finish by leaving this graphic up. And my um, advisers, my experts, assure me that there are copies of this in a postcard form, possibly tonight. So please do take one if you would like one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Inevitably, we've got questions, of course. So I'm just going to take the opportunity to ask one. And if you don't get your question asked, please tackle John later on. So this is about the numbers game, really. We've talked a bit about... Uh, <coughs> vets from the European countries mo moving back because of the Brexit issue. It relates to also to something BVA has been looking at, and that is sort of attrition of vets from the veterinary profession, and also the, the balance of the, perhaps the number of new graduates that might arise from new veterinary schools. What's the sort of general view about the numbers going? I think there's several things going on there. So people have had concerns about recruitment and retention of vets, particularly in practices, for some time, and that predates anything to do with the EU. I think that's the first thing to say. So we are working very hard to try and shed some light as to what is going on there. And one of the most obvious things we're doing is we've commissioned research from the University of Exeter, social scientists, to try and find out if we can get some actually firm metrics and information on that to help inform the debate. Um, so I think that's a very important thing to say. Um, we are concerned that post... Um, our departure from, I hate you saying Brexit, it's a horrible word, but post-EU, we are concerned about veterinary supply. At the moment, there's about 1,000, very roughly, 1,000 new graduates um, come in from the UK every year and about 1,000 from the EU every year. So 2,000 people join the profession, very approximately, and about half of those are from the EU. And we know that some work done by the RCVS has indicated that a significant number of our EU colleagues are saying, actually, I'm quite concerned that I'm not sure if I want to stay in the UK. And about a fifth are saying we're actually quite, um, really looking quite seriously at leaving. So we consider that a very, very important matrix 
or metric. We work very closely with our CVS on this, I should add, and with DEFRA, and we're involved with the Veterinary Capability and Capacity Project. In terms of new veterinary schools, I think we're just starting a working group to look at veterinary education, which I think is highly significant, but um, of course those places will take a long time to come online. So the simple answer is could be highly significant, but probably not for the next few years. Right. Thanks, John. Well, we're going to have to call this uh, session to end, but thank you very much thank indeed. Thank you very much.